my name's Alex, and I'm an engineer, right? I use this stuff for a living. So you're gonna, I'm gonna tell you about my experience of using that, and where my biases were, and what it's like to actually use this for the first time. So I'm not an EDA guy, I'm not trying to sell anybody anything here, and I'm not a, a formal expert. In fact, I, I think that'll probably become quite obvious as we actually go through the slides. So to give you some context, um, I'm, I've been a Dave in various Bristol companies for about 20 years, a design and verification engineer for those not familiar with the parlance. So I've done this, I've been on both sides, I've uh, you know, written RTL and I've also like, verified that same RTL and worked in teams where um, somebody else has designed RTL and I've verified it and vice versa, etc. But at Broadcom, I'm a purely verification guy. Um, and I, I explain this not to give you some like expertise credentials or anything like this, but actually to point out that I'm a just show me the waves guy. If you if you cut me, I bleed red X's. You know, I'm dyed in the wall dynamic simulation bloke. Um, I've been using simulations, waveforms, and that sort of stuff. I've been using them for years and years for all my career. Um, my first simulation was like in the 1990s. You know, transition. Um, transaction level models and that sort of stuff. Um, I moved on to the constrained random approach in about 2000, using some specmen and stuff like that. And I'm only really just starting to use UVM, um, be primarily because we're heavily C++ focused and um, in many of the companies that I've worked with. Um, so what experience do I actually have a formal before I embarked on actually using it? Well, literally, I'd only heard the term state space explosions, and that was from hanging around ST in about 2001, hearing people, they had a dedicated team there. And I used to hear that phrase all the time. And then I really didn't hear very much about it until I started to see you know, some more people talking about um, um, Jasper and stuff like that. So Jasper's what we use in Broadcom. Um, I'm sure they use all the other tools in Broadcom. We're a huge company. Um, so, but my experience here is with Jasper. So, um, and I've heard good things about um, people using it in the office. Um, before that, I'd used um, some assertion-based verification, but like pretty much the training course I went on had some ludicrously, ludicrously constructed examples. The, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail kind of like um, solution to the, just test benches entirely made out of uh, assertions, which is just crazy because they just obscure the fact of how you actually use these things sensibly. Um, and I have to put my hand up, I would actually tend towards monitors. Yeah, you know, rather use an assertion, I put something in there that punches over to the screen, um, which is probably not the best practice. Um, but the industry seems to be moving away from full formal proofs, although there seems to be some evidence in here that that's still very much a focus. Um, but there are, I'm using, going to use the word apps in a minute, I'll just prepare you all for that. But there is a focus, a focus on some of the smaller problems and tasks, primarily probably to get people like me actually using the tools and therefore get more licenses in. Um, but well, the apps are great. These are the automation of some of the most boring routine stuff I have to do every day. I, do I really want to have to verify the, um, the reset values of registers on every single project? How do you degrade, how do you say apps are rubbish when every single time I have to go do a new company, I have to learn a whole new way to do the same thing again and again and again. Hopefully that's getting better with UVM and the register layer stuff. And with the automation there, hopefully I will never have to do it again. I'll just describe my registers and everything will be happy. And now there are tools to help debug problems. My waves are in there, so I can actually get counterexamples with waves. So it, you're giving me the problem in something I'm used to looking at it. Um, the red line there is to remind me to say, I just heard talking about it. Just try another engine is not a good solution. Right, for me to try and fix an undetermined proof. An undetermined proof goes off in the woods. Tell me you're the vendor who says, have you got the latest version for a start? The next thing they will say to you is like, oh, have you tried another engine? It's like, hey, I just want to auto-proof. I just want to stick this in there. I just want the tool to figure it out. If it can't tell me, if it doesn't, um, if it's undetermined, I want some tool to tell me, yeah, you might want to try to change this, you might want to change that, or, and to automatically try all the different engines for me. I don't want to understand what the engines do. I don't have to, you know, go and uh, figure out exactly which geek approach to use there. And you know what? If your tool doesn't support that, maybe I'll look at somebody else's tool that does. Because I really, really don't want to get that deep. I just want to solve my problem and move on to the next one. <laughs> so with that, let's actually talk about what I actually did for these hundred days. In reality, it's more like a bit of a year, but hey. Um, so the first first thing I did, no training, just some script. Um, 
with some pipeline verification. Now, conceptually, this is very, very simple. What we're actually trying to do here is prove that when this has some data and this can accept it, it moves. It's, it's conceptually very simple. In reality, it's a bit more complicated than that. I'll go through that. But effectively, if that doesn't happen, you've lost some performance. And when you're designing processes and the likes of that, performance is everything. So <coughs> in a pre-formal approach, we could use a monitor saying, mm, hang on a minute, something should have happened there, and it didn't happen. It would fire up, and it would admit an error, performance is lost. Now, that red is there to remind me, admit an error. Who, who uses warnings in dynamic simulations? Is anybody brave enough to admit to doing that? Because that's like a complete failure of verification engineer. It's like, you know what, I can't decide. Is this, is this actually bad? Should I admit an error and say it's bad? Or, or should I just put it as an info and let them sort it out? Guys, just use errors, you know, or fatals. So assertions, that's the next, uh, the next thing we're going to do. This is probably a much more um, modern approach to actually um, uh, solving this problem. So we want to fire an assertion when the performance is lost. So I've got an example here. Um, I just realized as I was thinking about it, it looked far much better if I actually swapped it around. Effectively, all we're really saying here is this guy's Yes. What we're saying is here, on every single cycle after reset, make sure if this goes valid, that actually that was because this we have data here to put in. Actually, if you swap that around, it's best saying if data this could accept data, this has some data, then you should get valid there should be valid data in the second stage. Conceptually, very, very simple. So you go and put that in your simulation, you go and run billions of cycles. But fundamentally, as assertion on its own, you're just proving a negative. All you can really say at the end of your billions of cycles is, well, I've never seen it fire. You know, you've got some idea that this thing's checking. You know, you can see that the consequent and all that sort of stuff has happened. But actually, you've got, you're nowhere near actually closer to saying, well, actually, yeah, definitely this is not a problem. And because you've got no completeness metric, there's no, you always have to add the caveat, yet. You know, you're not, you're not really sure either. There's nothing to tell you that, like, you're just this close. You just need to try a little bit harder. Effectively, it retains your human factor. You're going to go through that saying, yeah, I'm happy with that. And whenever I use the term human in this presentation, you should always think possibly wrong human because, you know, we're human. <laughs> so let's look at what we do when we take a formal approach. So actually, you just take your assertions, you just throw them into the tool, you type auto proof, almost actually. It's a little bit more than that. You have to do a bit of elaboration and stuff like this. But actually, it is pretty simple to get going. Um, Best thing is, it proves it either correct. Well, in an ideal situation, it would prove it either correct, so it's proven, or says it's incorrect and gives you a counterexample. Actually, you can get undetermined where the tool just can't figure out what's going on and goes on forever. Luckily, I haven't seen very much of that. There's just a few pe other people's proofs that I've seen that um, actually do that. Um, the amazing thing about this is, um, actually, execution is often far, far quicker than it is actually to use a simulator, just to get the simulator to rebuild. Um, it usually takes longer than just completely redoing, re-elaborating and putting it, and you'll get a proof with your counterexamples again. And um, this is an active um, verification because it will say proven. You can stop when it says proven, although you have to be a little careful about that, as I'll show you an example of that later on. But proven means your job's done. That, from a, coming from a dynamic point of view, is a, a luxury. It's fabulous. I can actually sit this thing says, good, done, move on to the next one, rather than are you sure, nagging DAOs, keeping you awake at night sort of thing. Um, and as we've mentioned before, assertions can live on a simulation. Um, just in case somebody, you know, changes something, improves something, adds a new feature, um, they live there. So actually, you can find them. And if you keep them bound in your, like, sanity tests and stuff like that, you've got some, they will get a warning saying, you've done something bad. You should think about what you've done. Um, <coughs> So let's look at some of the lessons I learned from this. Now, as I said, actually, conceptually, this thing is quite simple. But in reality, those two signals, um, valid, or valid is usually pretty easy, but the moving or empty signal is actually um, can be quite complicated. And as I, um, for some blocks, this is very, very simple. But for some other blocks, uh, I found I had to use a lot of assumptions, and then more assumptions, and then more and more assumptions. And the problem there was I was verifying at the wrong level. I needed to go up. Level. So as I, as I said, one of the grandly here, 
I got to reconsider my proof boundary. So basically, I had to go up and try to inc include the actual drivers of those signals in there. And then the tools could figure out what was going on, and I didn't need an assumption, and it could actually it all prove itself at all very nicely. Plus, I actually got the bonus of it proving that part, the extra part of the um, circuit. Of course, your assumptions become assertions in dynamic simulation. So you have got that kind of you know, checking again going on. But you know, if we go down that lane again, we're still proving a negative. It's, just, it's nice to have them, but hey, we shouldn't rely on that sort of thing. So let's look at the second task. So this is an arbiter. Let's not go on too much about it. Basically, the older it gets, the more higher priority it is, except for when things are like being speculatively kind of resent on this. <coughs> Now, the thing I picked up about this is, actually, some problems really, really suit formal approaches. This, this priority scheme really only needed like one assertion per kind of priority level, all based around kind of the, uh, the actual bus um, integrity. And I was surprised. I wrote this thing. It's like about five or six lines long, um, and it proved the whole thing. And I realized. Actually, trying to prove the priority using dynamic situation would just be a waste of billions and billions of cycles. And it can be really hard work trying to get it into some of these little corners, you know, especially if you're trying to do this stuff in a top-level context, you know, which some, some you know, companies like to do. Um, so effectively, what I've realized is that you can actually use the formal to prove the arbiter is actually doing its proper arbiting, it's got its proper... Um, uh, the priority scheme is correct inside there. And at the top level in dynamic simulation, what we should really be proving is that actually that arbiter is fit for the purpose we put it to. That actually when we send the tra pattern of traffic down there, what we expect to get, it actually gets us the result that we want. And actually, I think overlapping these methodologies is the key to getting efficient verification. So I, I know there's lots of talk of just taking a giant model and proving it all with um, you know, formal. Well, actually, if you can do a little bit of both, overlap them here, Fabulous, you know, it's, it's great. You can save a load of cycles uh, off of this uh, simpler problem in the middle and concentrate on, you know, the larger context at the, uh, at the system level. So one of the lessons I learned here is I, when I was first trying to do it, I was just trying to figure out where, where does this bus come from? Where, where, where does this output come from? So at first I, I started to use deposits and forces and assumptions and stuff like that to actually identify the buses. It's a real rookie a kind of uh, dynamic uh, verification um, mistake. I had to I'm trying to figure out where that traffic came from. Actually, in reality, you don't need to do that. You use dollar past, and the tool will do whatever it needs to do to tell you that it went wrong. So it goes and actually actively tries to break your circuit. You don't have to do stuff in there to help you, on, you know, figure out what, what actually went round. It will do all of that for you. And that was a real epiphany when I, I kind of realized that. Ah, the tool will break the block for me. <laughs> That's what it does. I don't need to try hard to do that. And it will show me what it did. So let's look at my uh, third task. So we have uh, anti-hogging here. This is quite um, conceptually, again, very, very simple. Block A shouldn't spend too much time. Um, you know, shouldn't block out block B for too long. And I did make a mistake. And I, I, it was quite interesting, because you talked about this exact mistake <laughs> that I made here, which was the specification was vague. It was just said, block A, you shouldn't hold off block B for too long, blah, blah, blah. Maybe there was a number in there. I can't remember now. Um, but I really struggled to figure out how to actually phrase that as one property. I thought, if I'm going to be a good formal engineer, I will write one property. And this one property will define the whole thing. And then you know, I will prove that property, and life will be fantastic. Actually, um, I didn't. I struggled. I couldn't really do that. So I dug into the RTL a bit to cheat a little bit. I take a few signals out of there. And then what happened? I start to prove the implementation. And I proved the implementation did the right thing. But unfortunately, later on when we did some dynamic simulation, we found that implementation was wrong. The actual implementation did the right thing, but it didn't meet the specification. And, and then I found the flip side of the formally proven thing is then it was like, well, hang on a minute. I thought you were formally proven this. Isn't that like the gold standard? This is 100%. What, what's gone wrong here? You know, how could this be wrong? You've proven it with formal. What happened? And um, so, you know, <laughs> kind of said, sorry, sorry, it was probably my fault. I had to admit that. I went and had a look in and I realized, yes, I had actually gone too far down. I'd gone too much into the implementation. I should have kept my abstraction higher, proved the intent of the logic, and not the implementation. And you know what? If you had to have a little bit of logic, behavioral logic, it's OK. It's fine. No one's really going to tell you off that. All that really matters is to get done. the job gets done. 
And the great thing was, I actually proved a bug in the fix. Yay! So I was back on track. So, <laughs> so let's go on to um, sign-offs and that now. Um, now I've had to do some sign-offs. So luckily, nothing as bad as this, where you're asked to sign in your own blood and sacrifice some goats and chickens. But you know, some sign-off things have been not too far away from this. <laughs> now, design and verification is all great. We're all scientists and engineers and that here, and we like to follow all of these methods. That's fine until you don't get your 100%. And then we're all kind of sitting there saying, well, you know, with my 20, 25 years experience of this, I think this is good to ship, and the silicon will be perfect. You know, there's, there's a bit of an art there, isn't there? So you, you, is it, are you close enough? Can you sign off on that last little bit? Um, you know, you leverage your reputation a little bit, you know, so hold the expertise thing. So let's look at what traditionally we're, we're talking about here when we talk about sign-off. So if you've not got your 100% coverage, you might add some coverage refinements, you might review it all, then you actually say, well, okay, ignore that, ignore that, that can't happen. Way 100%, fantastic. You might have executable waivers of tickle, pearl scripts, whatever, things which actually go through and say, yes, I acknowledge that warning or error, but that's okay, that's fine. Um, so you actually want something which actively goes through the, in response to what's coming out of the tool, and you're signing off on, yeah, we understand that, we know that, that isn't a problem, so don't report that when I ask you what's wrong. Or as you see in text waivers, sign in blood. You know, that your, your word that uh, it's all okay and you definitely, you know, will definitely pay for the respin costs if it, you know, all goes wrong. <coughs> so, but the problem with all of this sort of stuff is they rely on the human interpretation of code, uh, you know, in the context by humans. Again, I remind you, for humans, we're talking about possibly wrong entities here. Um, and even if you're backing this sort of stuff with monitors and assertions, um, actually, we're still, you know, we're still in that proving the negative territory. So can we use formal to actually help us actively sign off some of these things? So let's look at unreachable cover points. Um, is it, are they logically impossible, or are you just not trying hard enough? You know, that, that's a, or maybe you're maybe you're too stupid to solve this problem. So um, effectively, this is the question you've got to answer with this. So traditionally. You go and get some waves up, sit there with your buddies, go and review it, say, yeah, we definitely think that can't happen. We'll sign off on that. You might write some like, script to help you um, tweak the figures and that afterwards, but somehow record that actually you reviewed it, you think it's okay, that's unreachable. Actually, better methods is use an assertion or a monitor or a legal bin statements and stuff like that to actually say, well, actually, this shouldn't happen in dynamic simulation. So actually, as you're going along, if this thing gets seen, something gets fired, um, so a warning comes up, then somebody gets fired. No, um, you, you're there, you're checking, you're looking for it. You've said this shouldn't happen, you, so you put a check in to prove that that shouldn't happen. But you're not really proving it, it's a negative. Actually, the best method is to actually prove the unreachability using assertions and a formal tool of your, of your choice. And then leave those assertions in the RTL, you know, just in case somebody tweaks something. Um, and I've actually done this. I had two truculent cover points. I tried looking at the RTL. It was almost undecipherable. Had tons of parameters and all this sort of stuff. And I actually went, fired up the formal tool, pointed at this and said, this can't go true. And it went, you're right, it can't go true. And then I said, OK, can it go false? And it said, yes, it can go false. It showed me the, um, actually, the way from there. So I actually understood the RTL from that as well. And that actually proven it was unreachable. And I could actually remove the but I left the assertion in with a comment um, tied into our system saying, yes, I have proven this is an unreachable cover point and it has been removed. And the assertion is in there just in case it becomes real at some point in the future. So let's have a look at STA constraints now. This is a, a, an interesting one because, uh, you know, this is in the back end land, you know, it's not front end land where we, you know, the, the verification, the design ver verification people live. Um, False and multi-cycle paths we're talking about here. Now, these are things which actually are primary inputs into the, they're describing how the circuit should work in the back end. But actually, and I'm sure your company does, but in lots of companies I've worked for, all the ones that I've gone bankrupt, you know, none of the ones who could sue me or anything, have had no check at all for them. It literally it is the word of the RTL guy, that is what, you know, my, um, they capture all the stuff in the, um, like a tickle script or, um, and actually say, this is how I expect the thing, but this is a false path. You know, this is a multi path. I promise I won't look at that signal while you're waggling it. Um, 
traditionally, you go and look at the STS. You put this into the STA tool, you'd have a look at it. Um, you go, might, you might have to do some SDF sims. Now, SDF sims, oh, SDF sims, are, um, that's a conspiracy by back end guys to put the verification people on the critical path again. They, these are horrible things. They're slow, they take hundreds of times slower than, anything, than normal, regular simulations. And actually, you know, sort of the chances of actually in traditional simulations of actually finding anything with them is, uh, you know, is really quite difficult. Uh, but except if you've got a constraint capture, that's exactly one of the r good reasons for still running these. If you've actually said something shouldn't happen or shouldn't, shouldn't should behave at this, and that really is not how it actually has ended up, uh, there's a chance that you might well find it in there. And I think that you know nobody really wants is brave enough to give these things up because they do find issues. But actually, what would be far better was if we could actually take all of these uh, false and multi-site capacitor and actually say, well, okay. I'm going to put an assertion in there, or a monitor, or, or an SDA script that actually says prove that this is correct. Um, so that actually you've got some, you know, between what I actually say is what I expect. Um, I expect from the um, from the logic is actually what's going on. But far better would be to actually prove that constraint, to take that assertion, put it into the formal tool, and prove that's actually what you've got. So rather than just relying on uh, a lucky scenario to actually capture it, and you know, all of these things are better than I've, what I've, I've seen in a lots of different places. But, you know, I think we could be moving, because they're so quick to run these things, I think we could be moving to land where we're actually using the tool to actually formally sign off on a lot of stuff. And it, it wouldn't be me if I didn't talk about Jenkins. So, um, if you can script it, you can automate it, and you probably should. And there's no reason why we can't take this active sign-off um, idea with formal. We can run it as sign up as part of a continuous integration. So this is not particularly difficult to do. You just like need to like a little script. Maybe even EDA vendors you'd like to do this for us. So they want you to literally just go through all of your assertions, dump out a JUnit file, uh, put a file, file tag in there unless it's proven. We can negotiate on some other levels. Maybe like uh, undetermined might be a skip or something. But um, it's definitely far more nuanced than just getting a non-zero exit status, although you can do that if you like. But why not just run this thing every single time people, you know, check it in? We created Jenkins' job, make it sensitive to the SCM um, so that if anybody changes the file, it reruns this. I say it's usually very, very quick. Enable the notorious email those who broke the build option. So everybody who actually committed something gets that email. And you know what, a bonus, if you keep those assumptions bound in your sanity builds, then if somebody does something bad, they usually get told about it before they check in, and then they have to prove that they ignored it. So, just to recap and conclude, some verification problems are more suited to a formal approach, some to a dynamic. Well, I wouldn't use either alone. I would use a, an overlapping verification flow um, and use the most appropriate where I can. Start with assertions. Formal almost comes for free if you ignore the multi-thousand-dollar cost of the license. Um, most most places, uh, most big places now, and there are increasingly only big um, um, silicon places left, um, usually have all you can eat licenses and all this sort of stuff. So actually using this sort of stuff really isn't that much of, you know, you could experiment with it really quite easily. Auto-prove is your friend. Um, active sign-off, prove your assertions, your constraints, your exceptions, and your excuses. Put them in there. Why not? Put your money where your mouth is. Let the tool actually say whether it's right or not. Um, and we should automate that process as well. This should just happen when everybody checks up and in. It is so quick and so easy to do. And um, yes, it's very easy to get started nowadays. The app-based approach is making it easy. It's easy to adopt. It helps solve a lot of your boring problems. And fundamentally, I had never used formal problem go, and now I can't imagine a flow that is well-rounded that doesn't have a formal element to it. And um, to include I. Uh, I met my hair organic background, and, it, I, and I under everybody told me not to do this, but I did get him to sign my book, testing testing what was it? testing um, test benches, isn't it? Um, is it? Anyway, designing test benches. Um, he went and signed this book, he was, um, and he uses this quote: "To err is human." Well, I say, well, actually, why trust humans? Then let's prove it. <laughs> and that's uh, that's me. <laughs> Thank you.